howdy. Nickelodeon has a reputation with some of its episodes. A reputation for sometimes covering bleak, brutal concepts. Paranoia, dark futures. So let's check them out today. Let's check out the top 10 darkest Nickelodeon episodes. But for this list, we really could use the help of a true master of the mysterious and creepy in kids shows. Hey again, Strider. Thought I'd drop by. Need a hand with this dark list? Ah, oh, hey again, George. It's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I'd really appreciate your help. Let's both check out Nickelodeon's most disturbing episodes over the years. Alrighty, let's go. Number 10. SpongeBob SquarePants. Plankton Paranoia. After 22 years, there's been quite a bit of grim episodes of SpongeBob SquarePants, ranging from Are You Happy Now, Krabby Patty Creature Feature, to One Course Meal. And we both talked about Nasty Patty, so why did you choose this one, Strider? Well, this episode just rarely gets talked about, despite its disturbing imagery and concepts. So I figured this would give us a chance to talk about a fresh SpongeBob episode. The episode's about the slow breakdown of Mr. Krabs, as his paranoia over plankton drives him to insanity. He seems fine to me. It starts gradually as Krabs begins enforcing stricter rules on anyone who enters the establishment. Soon, every single customer is being assaulted and banned from the store. You give in! Give in! Until Krabs even suspects Spongebob and Squidward, and fires them too. Krabs sits alone, literally foaming with fear and paranoia, and as his mind continues to break down, he even begins seeing giant demon planktons everywhere. This rapidly breaks into a pitch black nightmare, overflowing with giant demonic planktons. Wherever Krabs goes, whatever he thinks, his mind continues to fill him with terror, with seemingly no escape. He splashes water on his face, desperately trying to regain some control. But soon, even his eyeballs are erupting with tiny planktons. Ugh. He eventually suspects the whole town now works for Plankton, so Krabs secretly fills his patties with spikes and bear traps for them. It's a terrifying paranoid breakdown, but I really like the ending where it turns out that all of Krabs' friends, including Plankton, had just been planning a surprise anniversary party, simply celebrating Plankton's first attempt to steal Krabs' formula. This episode actually reminds me of One Course Meal, when Plankton was the one in paranoid terror. Yeah, that's true actually. The same scenario basically happens there, but this time the tables are turned on Krabs. It's a very disturbing, but still surprisingly good-natured episode. Mommy. Yes, Boyo! I enjoyed it very much! <laughs> My life as a teenage robot. The return of Raggedy Android. You don't breathe, honey! This episode discusses xenophobia, the enforcement of roles in society, and just plain creepy imagery. The episode starts out relatively normal when Jenny's just hanging around with her friend Brad at a teen hotspot restaurant. But then it turns out the restaurant's owner is a bit of a xenophobe who refuses service to all humans, and he forces Jenny to leave. So Jenny puts on her human exoskin, with some minor improvements from her mother. But the exoskin feels more like a creepy parasite, as it quickly engulfs and consumes Jenny in the shadows. Things start to get even weirder though, as Jenny finds herself unable to fight back against an alien biker gang, because the exoskin forcefully stops her and insists, it's not what a normal girl would do. A normal young lady would let the boys handle this. Ugh. Later that night, as Jenny sleeps, the skin slithers up and strikes her like a snake. With Jenny now wearing the skin permanently, the creepy organism continues to bend her mind, silently whispering to Jenny how to be a normal woman. Normal is good. Normal is good. But the more Jenny tries to fight back, the more the skin forces her into submission. Like some sort of 40s grandparent, it instructs her that fighting and taking action is not what a normal girl does. But eventually, Jenny does manage to fight back and gain control over the exoskin. But just as the episode ends, the xenophobic manager is left behind. And from the shadows, the skin strikes, latching on to its next victim. With a chilling story about forced oppression and bending of the mind, this remains a particularly dark Nickelodeon episode. <laughs> Drake and Josh. Josh is done. Well, stop being mad at me. I'm not mad at you. I'm done. 
What is that supposed to mean? I don't want anything to do with you anymore. This is probably the most serious Drake and Josh episode they ever did. I've personally found over the years that we can sometimes reach a breaking point and just give up on people. It can happen not to just our acquaintances, but our close friends too. Or in this case, even family. When you reach a point where your negative interactions with that person just far outweigh the positive, it can be a tragic and brutally honest side of reality with no easy answer. I'm done with you. Wow. In this case, Josh completely severs ties with his brother Drake and never wants anything to do with him again. Josh rapidly seems to become happier and even more successful without Drake in his life. Despite the inappropriate laugh track, the episode becomes sadder and grimmer for Drake as it continues. Despite him walking all over Josh over all those years, it turns out Drake was the one that needed Josh. I need you way more than you need me, all right? I I'm sorry. In the end, when Josh offers to be friends again, even Drake doesn't seem sure that Josh should come back. Yeah, that part really got me, actually. It seems like Drake realized just how much he damaged Josh's life over the years, and didn't want to do that to Josh again. It's like even he realized he was toxic to Josh's life. It's one of those situations where there's no definite right or wrong answer. No. But eventually, Josh's personal decision is to choose a life with Drake in it. And the two play ping pong, and something about that just seems more real and grounded, to me at least. I really agree. It felt like a very real, grounded ending. And it's an ending I wasn't sure whether to feel good or bad about. But I'm always glad to have a Nickelodeon episode that actually leaves me thinking. Back in time. Number 7. Danny Phantom, the ultimate enemy. Hey, I remember this one. As well as being dark, I think this is also among the best episodes of Danny Phantom, so good choice. Well thanks, George. I always seem to enjoy stories with the true villain as ourselves. I think it forces us to question our own morals, and where those morals might lead us long term without vigilance. In this case, we see Danny travel to a bleak future, where his future self has become the most evil ghost on the planet. Danny's future self has caused major catastrophic damage, outright killing much of his family and friends in an explosive apocalyptic end. It doesn't matter if I go back in time or not. I'll never turn into you. Never! Of course you will. It's only a matter of time. A lot of this episode, in fact, is just watching Danny get the horrible repercussions of his future self's decisions, with whoever remains alive being absolutely furious at him, many wanting to kill him. It's described to Danny as though this future evil self is inevitable in him, further inspiring Danny to remain vigilant in his future decisions. It's dark, but ultimately epic, and the story is great, and it remains one of my favorite Danny Phantom episodes. I guess the future isn't as set in stone as you think it is. Avatar The Last Airbender the Puppet Master. In this notorious episode of Avatar, Katara learns the one ability in waterbending that is never spoken of. The bending of water within our veins. Blood bending. There's water in places you never think about. As a master waterbender, the older lady Hama teaches Katara that liquid is everywhere. And I do mean everywhere. She carries a callous disregard for humanity and just treats people like liquid skins to be used to control, since humans are about 60% water. Katara is understandably uncertain about bending the water in people's veins, thinking that maybe it's a little underhanded. Well, yeah, it's certainly more than a little underhanded. The scene gets even more disturbing as Hama begins to manipulate the blood within Katara's veins, puppeteering her like a mannequin on strings. We see Katara's limbs bend and spasm and sharp, jagged movements, and the sounds highlight the pain each bend of the blood causes her. Even when Katara outmatches her, Hama soon turns Aang and Sokka into puppets fighting against her. In the end, Katara is forced to use bloodbending herself in order to stop Sokka from impaling Aang on a sword. Eventually, Hama is arrested, but her legacy was passed on to Katara. Congratulations, Katara. You're a bloodbender. <laughs> the Puppet Master is a masterclass of atmosphere, horror, and character. It explores the horrifying concept of losing control of your own body. Yet at the same time, it showcases the conflict of staying true to your virtues, even during dire scenarios. Go back in time. 
Mr. Meaty, the Mooch Master, aka the Tapeworm. <gasps> ah, Mr. Meaty. While the puppets themselves are horrifying enough as is, this episode decides to take it a step even further. It starts out innocently enough. Josh and Parker are just having a feud over Parker's need to steal other people's food. Parker! You moocher! However, Parker then eats some raw meat, leading to all his food disappearing in his stomach. Then we find out why. Oh, for... Oh, and I thought the puppets were hideous. You know those Muppet rejects? They're not creepy enough. I think we need to throw a tapeworm into this show. It turns out Parker has a giant tapeworm the size of a python festering in his stomach. So the boys fish it out and sell it to an Australian zookeeper. Here you go. Oh. I've handled these little beauties before. Who then promptly eats it. Oh, well, isn't that just peachy? You know, George, I think we've seen about all we need to see of this one. Yeah, let's let's move on. Rugrats, Chucky's Wonderful Life. Hey, if I remember right, I think you covered this one before, George. So what makes this one dark to you? Well, basically, it starts with Angelica telling Chucky that the world would be better off without him. Chucky decides to run away before meeting his guardian angel, who actually shows him a world where he never existed. You ain't seen nothing yet. <gasps> Tommy is now scourging the trash for food, looking homeless and dirty. Phil and Lil are house destroying troublemakers, and Angelica is now obese forcing Stu and Dee, Dee to make cookies for her, to which she never shares. Jeepus, that's grim. Also, Chucky's dad loses his mind. He talks to a sock and wishes they were real. Socky? Yeah? I wish you were real. Me too. Oh, come on, really? This is starting to sound more like a creepy pasta than an actual episode. Could I have just one little crumb of cookie, even if it's already been in your mouth, please? This episode parodied the classic 1946 film, It's a Wonderful Life, where our troubled protagonist, George Bailey, also wishes he was never born. Of course, both characters learn that their lives, as well as everyone's, has value to them. That's very true. Overall, this episode has a grim front, but ultimately has an important message for both kids and adults. Ren and Stimpy, Stimpy's fan club. In this episode, Ren finally reveals that same psychotic side we saw in him in Ren Seeks Help, as he begins meticulously planning how to murder Stimpy. The episode opens with Ren and Stimpy sorting through their fan letters. Unfortunately, it turns out they're all addressed to Stimpy, so we see Ren's hatred and anger slowly build and fester throughout the episode. At first, it looks like a rubber knife gag is as dark as the episode's going to get, but then we get tonal whiplash as we cut to the notorious bedroom scene. <laughs> uh, Strider, I, I, I don't know if that's the best phrase to use for this scene. Oh, what do you mean? What could possibly be misinterpreted about two guys living together having a bedroom scene? Anyway, in the notorious bedroom scene, Ren's hatred begins to spiral out of control as we see his veins pulsating with every thought. Ren remarks on how he feels tainted by what he's taking part in, commenting on his dirty hands and how it won't come off. Then suddenly, Ren is struck by an idea. He crawls over to Stimpy's sleeping body. His eyes dilate as he comments to himself about how frail and mortal Stimpy is, and how easily he could murder him with his own dirty hands. The tension slowly rises as Ren prepares to snap the neck of Stimpy. Just one quick twist, and it's over. But before Ren gets the chance to kill him, he's stopped by a sudden strike of pain. We see a close-up image of his hot, pulsating brain. Ren screams in agony as the background is engulfed in flames. A day later, after that weird scene, Ren ends up getting a letter after all and shows off his one fan letter to Stimpy instead of murdering him, which is most certainly a finer alternative. Touchingly, the letter is a fan mail to Ren from Stimpy. While admittedly, the episode's nice ending does soften the blow, it doesn't quite outweigh the terror-inducing psychopathic moments we'd already been subjected to. 
Invader Zim. Dark Harvest. Jeebus, this is a grim one. All the school children are slowly picked off as all their organs are gradually harvested by Zim. In Zim's misguided attempts to be more human. You think you can fool a trained medical professional? Yes. I suppose you've got a heart in there. Six of them. Intestines? Large or small. Spleen? In three different colors. What about lungs? <gasps> It rarely gets much darker on Nickelodeon than Invader Zim. In fact, much of its disturbing concepts were a knee-jerk reaction to Nickelodeon because of all their requests to make the show more kid-friendly. Ugh. Seeing internal organs removed from the body is generally reserved for grotesque body horror films. So when Nickelodeon, the 8 to 16 demographic kids network, creates an episode about Zim harvesting the organs of all the human children in school. Well, it comes off as a bit surprising. I mean, I like the episode, but it's still very creepy. Dib does try to stop Zim, but he doesn't stand much of a chance as he can't even keep track of Zim. Zim moves like a silent ninja in the shadows as he quietly mutilates everyone, replacing their organs with uh, random objects he can find lying around. I don't feel so good. Dark Harvest is a good example of the inherent similarities between fear and humor. You'll never pull this off! More organs means more human. It will work. And before we get to number one, just a couple of quick honorable mentions. Rugrats, Melville. This was probably my first exposure to the discussion of death in cartoon television. It discusses dying and their transitional periods of mourning. All through Chucky's dead bug, Melville, as a kid, this episode actually helped me better understand the process of loss. I can definitely recommend it. We'll do this when you're asleep for a long time. Like forever. Fairly Odd Parents, It's a Wishful Life. Most people tend to consider this episode unnecessarily cruel, as we see Timmy shown a world where he doesn't exist. And unlike Chucky's world, all his friends and family are made out to be considerably better off without him. While I like most of the dark episodes on this list, this is one of the few I'd personally skip. Rocco's Modern Life, to heck and back. Here we see our friend Heffa taken to hell. No, I'm not going to call it heck, because it is clearly hell, with a Satan about the equivalent to the genie from Aladdin. It's got some great jokes, and is overall just a fun, fourth wall breaking romp with Heffa causing trouble. Wait a minute, heck? Isn't it supposed to be- <laughs> Sensors. Hey Arnold, Ghost Bride. This is the only Hey Arnold episode that has a slasher movie feel to it. The episode starts with Eugene telling us of a woman that grabbed an axe and hacked her sister and boyfriend to pieces while they slept. She's later found sitting by them in a wedding dress, throwing rice over their corpses, and then proceeds to end her own life by jumping out a window. It's a surprisingly brutal, disturbing premise for a Nickelodeon episode. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Buried Secrets. The turtles think they've found April's mother, but it turns out to just be an otherworldly interdimensional horror. This end monster is some of the most gruesome CG I've ever seen from Nick. Seriously, some of the visuals on this thing are wow. I I'm really surprised this made it to Nick. The turtles and April do overcome it in the end though, but Jeebus, what a creepy monster. And with those said, on to number one. You can't give up hope. Trust me on that. You can go back in time. The Legend of Korra, Venom of the Red Lotus. Huh, The Legend of Korra. That's an interesting choice. What made you decide this over Invader Zim? Well, Zim can be dark, but it also has a silly, humorous tone to counterbalance this. Legend of Korra, though, has a far more realistic, serious, down-to-earth tone. And in this episode, we're essentially watching from the victim's point of view, as they are slowly poisoned, tortured, and killed. Chained up, unable to defend themselves as this happens. Wait, 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 hold on. Nickelodeon has an episode that involves torture? Well, yeah. And as dramatic, powerful, and artistic as this episode is, it can be downright spine-chilling. In the season three finale, Korra is held captive by the Red Lotus, an anarchist cult who wants to kill Korra in the Avatar state and end the Avatar cycle. The Red Lotus leader Zaheer rather nonchalantly explains to Korra that they're going to poison her by bending mercury into her bloodstream. Yew. And we watch one of the Red Lotus Earthbenders beginning admission of the mercury into Korra's tissue. <laughs> 
This leads to not just the most disturbing scene in Avatar history, but perhaps the darkest scene in all of Nickelodeon history. We witness every stage of Korra's torture. We even see through Korra's eyes as her consciousness struggles. But what I appreciate about this scene is that it's so immersive that we feel that shock and fear right along with Korra. And through that, we're better able to understand her vulnerability and the terror she is going through and how fundamentally wretched the idea of torture really is. It's gripping, it's disturbing, but immersive and done with such psychological detail. Let go. Let go. Let go. Let go. Nick, 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 Nick. Nickelodeon, the kids' network. <laughs> Good one, Patrick. But eventually, not even the poison can stop Korra, as she enters the Avatar states and breaks free, enacting her revenge on the cult. Korra begins chasing Zaheer down, literally as she's dying from poison. Did I mention this lady is awesome? But when she eventually collapses from the poison, the cult leader Zaheer begins to suffocate her. Korra is quickly saved by her friends, and most of the mercury is removed. <coughs> but her body and mind are still left crippled. There is realistic repercussions to Korra for this traumatic event. She struggles to rebuild her body after the poisoning, and even suffers very real post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, it takes her till the final three episodes of the series to come to better terms with being tortured and nearly killed. Korra's experiences of pain, torture, and attempted murder leave a major emotional impact, both on Korra and the viewers. And for that powerful emotional impact, I personally consider it both one of the best and the darkest Nickelodeon episode of all. I think it's always worth pointing out though, that I would personally never censor any of these episodes. These darker episodes often show us a more vulnerable, fearful side to the Nickelodeon characters we know. Kids get to see that Spongebob and Krabs get scared too and that it's okay to be scared and not in control of everything. I, I need you more than you need me. What matters is what we decide to do with that fear and how we handle the control we do have. By the way, thanks for coming on the show again, George. It's always a real treat to have your assistance. No problem, Strider. I was glad to help in some way. If you need a hand in the future, I'll be on my channel blaming on George. Until we meet again. Until we meet again. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs> Uh, Shredder, I, I don't know if that's the best phrase for this scene. Oh, what do you mean? What could possibly be misinterpreted about two guys living together having a bedroom scene? Ren and Stimpy partake in group activities they can both enjoy. <laughs>